a lot of people enjoy, you know, stuff that is painful. So I was one of these persons that say, oh, I eat always chili pepper, I can eat more and more and get accustomed to that and get to the next step and get inside. always hotter chili. In reality, it's not so simple. But most of the time, you're oh, it's hot, and then you take another one and say, well, it will be less, and it's, it's even more. It's not that more you eat, less you perceive that. Marco Tizano is an investigator at the Monell Chemical Census Center whose interest in the science of spicy didn't begin in a lab. Nights and weekends I was working as a chef and I was fascinated by the idea of the other type of perception, of sensory perception, how they works. And that is how I started my adventure in science. And while Dr. Tizano can cook many delicious dishes, his research has little to do with taste and smell. Instead, his focus is on chemesthesis. Chemesthesis is practically the science, the study, the perception of the pain transmitted by the trigeminal nerve. Which branches out from a central ganglion in your head, down throughout your nose, mouth, and eyes. And so all these processes will just transmit the sensation from this periphery part to this central ganglion and give you a sensation of uh, pain or cold or, or warmth, depending what you are using as stimuli. In the case of chili peppers, that stimuli is a molecule known as capsaicin, which causes a burning sensation, amongst other maladies. How does one molecule achieve such a lasting effect? Capsaicin is a molecule that will bind specifically to a class of receptors that are called TRIP-B. And they are in mucosas, like the mouth, the nose, the eyes. So imagine capsaicin like a, a key and the receptor TRIP-B1 like a door. Uh, when the capsaicin will bind to the door, will open the receptor, and the receptor will allow ion to run through it. This change of potential will be transmitted through the nerve to the central nervous system, to the brain, and that is where you get the pain sensation of the heat. But then locally, there is this release of a neurotransmitter that is called substance P and CGRP, and those are the ones that will cause you the swelling, the pain, and the other sensation. But then there is also fibers in the nose, you will activate there a local inflammation. And that is why you have running nose or sneezing and because the same nerve is also stimulating the eyes. Then you will have your watering eyes. And because the whole reaction is meant to protect you from what your body has deemed unhealthy, there are few methods to stop the process. You can't drink water because... The sensation will come back again because capsaicin is still stuck on the receptor. Another way is to drink something that contains fat like milk or something that contains alcohol, like beer, because the alcohol and fat in the milk will actually move that from the receptor. So what if you expose the system over and over again? Can you actually desensitize it? So there is all these studies that demonstrate that very short presentation of a capsaicin molecule in a very short time frames will cause you to sensitize the receptor. Perception of that will be stronger and stronger and stronger until you, do, you stop because you cannot bear that anymore. The pain does diminish eventually, but that's not because you've gained a tolerance to the chemical. What happens is that uh, the receptor will not desensitize, but it will internalize inside the membrane of the fibers, because you want to protect the nerve from getting damaged. If the pain does seem to go away in the long term, you might actually be damaging your nerves. If there is somebody more sensitive to that, it may damage that system, and also sometimes you cannot come back from that, and you will lose that system. And if all of this doesn't convince you that you can't just build tolerance to spicy food, just remember, it's all in your head anyway. There is several studies that demonstrate that if you eat hot pepper, or if you have a person that don't eat hot pepper, and you pro provide them different concentration of chili pepper, both of them will describe with no statistical difference that this chili pepper were unbearable or mild or very bland. Uh, and that is because uh, the people that eat the hot pepper still perceive that as a pain, but they enjoy it. You eat that and say, oh, I can do that, but it's just because you want to do that, but it's very painful anyway. If you've ever had supermarket salsa, and come on, who hasn't, you've probably tasted one of Ed Curry's chili peppers. 
Curry is a chili breeder, and he estimates that over 80% of the chilies grown commercially in the U.S. come from lines he developed on this farm. We're in Pierce, Arizona, elevation about 4,200 foot. We're a high desert. We're right in the valley where uh, Cochise and Geronimo ran, the famous Indians. And we pretty much spent our life working on improving long green chilies. <laughs> Specifically, the species Capsicum anum, which actually doesn't narrow it down all that much. Bell peppers, jalapenos, and Curry's Anaheim crosses are all the same species. Think Pomeranians and poodles. Domesticated dogs are all one species too, but they've been bred for different traits. Curry's basically doing the same thing with peppers, crossing different lines in these test flocks to optimize different characteristics from the size of the plant. Oh, normally a Mexican ancho? is going to be up here like this. To how it tastes. The skin thickness and the flavor are huge on these. Spiciness can also be selected for. Most everybody thinks that, that seed are hot. But they're not. The heat actually comes from a liquid made of compounds called capsaicinoids, and capsaicin is the most common of them. The capsaicin is actually a little bead of oil along that placenta right there. A real hot chili will have a big, strong bead of that. The further down the heat goes, down that placenta wall, the further the, the hotter it is. And if you're a chili connoisseur, you may have also noticed that the burn doesn't always hit you in the same place. Some peppers you eat burn you on the tip of your, kind of the edges of your lips. Some tend to get you more in the tongue. Some get you in the back of the mouth. Some actually even wait a little while, and then you feel it after you've ate the pepper, and then like later your throat kind of gets you down here. Curry says the location of the burn and its intensity are related to which capsaicinoids are present. The level of heat generated by capsaicinoids can be quantified. Units of spiciness are called Scovilles, after chemist Wilbur Scoville, who invented a way to measure spice using chromatography. For reference, habaneros are about here, and by the way, they're not the same species as chilies. Jalapenos here, and Curry's most famous pepper, the Arizona 20, is here. The breakthrough with the Arizona 20 is that the heat is pretty stable. The previous standard variety, which was New Mexico 6.4, some pods would be mild, but some pods would be hot, so there was no consistency in it. Curry says that environmental stresses like drought or disease can actually make a pepper a little bit spicier. Arizona 20 narrowed that range of spiciness. One industry for which consistent spice is crucial is salsa. For medium always to be medium, salsa companies start with completely mild chilies. And then these companies that make the salsa add in enough capsaicin to reach those levels so that you know you can go buy that same bottle every time and it's going to taste that same every time. Salsa's big business. It's the largest condiment in the world. It's above ketchup. It's above everything. And Curry's at the center of it. He says that Frito-Lay, the largest salsa producer, has approached him to develop a new breed of chili for them. You know, that's where the art of breeding basically comes is, is yes, it takes a lot of knowledge from, from understanding the, the genetic world, but then it just flat takes a bunch of art of living and loving chili to understand, if I put this with this, what will I get? I'm sure we'll taste it. I'm Flora Lichtman for Science Friday. Do you know a chili head? These are people who can't get enough spice in their life. They might keep a little packet of chili flakes in their bag so they can dip into it in a pinch. And they're the ones smiling and sweating after a fiery meal. So what makes someone a spice addict and another person go running for the milk? Does that milk trick really work to extinguish the flames? Can you build up a tolerance? for spice. All questions that we're going to ask and answer with our video producer, Luke Raskin, who's here to tell us all about a cascade of chemicals set off by those tiny peppers. It's the subject of our latest video. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, Ira. So when you bite a spicy uh, pepper in your mouth, you feel a you're burning hot sensation, right? Is that the same, kind of, same type of reaction that happens when you drink a hot cup of coffee? Is it the same thing going on in your well, yeah, for the most part it is. Um, both the heat and the active ingredient in a chili pepper, which is called capsaicin, it's a molecule, um, they both act on the exact same receptor, which is called a TRPV1 receptor. Most people call it trip, trip V1. And um, what happens is, you know, when, when you drink a hot cup of coffee or you the capsaicin mm -hmm. binds to that receptor, uh, uh, the 
receptor opens up, ions flood in, those ions trigger the cell to become receptive. You have a, a, a signal that goes through the nervous pathway all the way to your brain that says, this is hot, this is hot. And it's the exact same sensation. Um, the difference here is that when you drink a really hot cup of coffee, you can actually destroy cells. You can burn yourself. But with capsaicin, it's not going to actually damage anything um, unless you have it in really high concentrations, at which point you can damage a nerve. You know, whenever you go out to people and, and you're eating hot food and you say you see people who are just chowing down on the chili peppers, you say, oh, uh, you've built up a tolerance to it over the years, right? Is that true? Well, a couple more, a couple things are more likely. If you've been eating really hot chili peppers your entire life, you may have possibly damaged your nerves, or you may be just inherently not as sensitive to capsaicin. So th those are possibilities. But what's probably more likely is that you're just a little bit more masochistic than other people, and you've kind of learned to enjoy <laughs> the heat more. You know, it does release endorphins in your brain, so so maybe you're a little addicted to the the endorphin release in your brain. Um, mm -hmm. It's very, you know, you're not going to suddenly have receptors that are that are less sensitive to capsaicin all of a sudden because you've just been exposing. That's not really how the receptors work. The video that uh, you just finished and put up on our website, it, in it you put our staff through it. Chili test. Yes, yes, I, I did. And, and, and you put a trick in there, didn't you? I sure did. So I gave people the choice of tasting the spicy sauce or the less spicy sauce. Um, it was actually the same sauce. But beyond getting some really great reactions from the staff, which you can see in the video, people make some really interesting expressions when they have something really spicy. Everybody said they experienced roughly the same amount of heat. They all felt it in the same place in their mouth at roughly the same time. What they differed in was how they experienced it, whether they enjoyed it more. And the people that went for the more spicy sauce, those were the ones that clearly were enjoying the heat a lot more. And that's kind of backed up with, with, with research that, that's been done that showed that when people, when people that are really spice heads or not spice heads have the exact same chili, um, they both perceive the same amount of heat. It's just the people that have, that like the chili, the heat, they say they like it more. Yeah. You know, after you've had something hot, people always tell you to, to drink milk, not water. That's true. Does, does, does that really work? Absolutely. And better, better than milk is ice cream. Because, oh, really? Yeah. Well, so with ice cream, you get a cooling factor because it's ice cream. Um, but inside of milk is two different things. you got fat and you got casein. And capsaicin, uh, the molecule that causes the heat, has a long nonpolar tail on it. And when you have something like fat um, that you're eating, it, it can bind to the, the nonpolar tail. Or if you have ca casein, which is really into binding to hydrocarbons and nonpolar um, uh, molecules, mm -hmm. then it will grab onto that as well. So ice cream or milk definitely works. Well, finally, the last question to you is sometimes that, you know, the, the sensation can continue after you swallow. Like, can the peppers and the capsaicin hurt your intestinal lining? Well, it it can... It can hurt you, the person, but you'd need really high concentrations in order to actually hurt your intestinal mm. lining. What's going on is you've probably got a lot of inflammation. Um, that that can cause a little bit of damage, but it really, you know, the capsaicin itself is not yeah. going to damage you unless you have a ghost pepper or something like that. Yeah, I'm not getting one of those. <laughs> Neither am I. Not for your movie. Neither am I. Nobody's movie. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Luke Roskin, our Science Friday video producer. And you can watch that video uh, where we subjected sci-fry office uh, members <laughs> to spice on our website. It's up there at sciencefriday.org slash peppers, sciencefriday.com slash peppers. With uh, When, when uh, your mouth is uh, burning and your eyes are tearing up, it can be hard to uh, appreciate the subtleties of a spicy pepper. How can the tingle of a jalapeno differ from the searing burn of a habanero? Well, hundreds of varieties of peppers are out there with their own heat profile, and my next guest says that the heat profile of a chili pepper is not unlike the complex flavors of wine. You know how complex that can be, and... He's here to take us uh, through a taste test and tell us how these different chili peppers get their heat. Uh, Paul Bosland is director of the Chili Pepper Institute and Regents Professor of Horticulture at New Mexico State University. That's in Las Cruces. Welcome to Science Friday. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm almost uh, afraid to ask uh, this test I'm going to be taking with you. But when, when you go into the supermarket, you go in with a whole different attitude than most people about chili peppers. There are, because you know there are all different varieties of chili peppers, but I understand there are five main species, right? 
Correct. There's capsicum anum, which is the most common one. That's the bell pepper, the jalapeno, serrano that you see. And then the capsicum chinense, which is the habanero, becoming much more common. And that's what uh, the ghost pepper is and some of the super hots. And then um, capsicum frutescence, most people will only know this through Tabasco, like Tabasco hot sauce is made from that. And then there's two that people really don't know yet to, in the United States. And one is capsicum baccatum, which is the chili from South America sometimes called ahi, and this is the Peruvian or Bolivian chili. So if you go to a per, uh, Peruvian or Bolivian restaurant, you'd ha have those chilies seasoning the dish. And then the last one is called capsicum pubescence or ricotto, lakoto, and it's very, very different and very, very rare to find in the supermarkets in the United States right now. But if you were in Peru and you were to get a uh, stuffed pepper, it would probably be the ricotto. And a lot of uh, people will eat that thinking it's a bell pepper. And then, boy, are they surprised when the heat kicks in. Oh, I can, I can imagine. I, you know, I'm, I'm surprised in not being a, uh, I mean, a chili eater and a chili expert like you are that people can't really tell the difference between the different peppers there. Oh. oh, yeah. Um, when you look at the what, what I describe as a heat profile, there, there's characteristics to chilies. And I tell people if you begin to become um, conscious of, of these, these uh, characteristics, you will then be, know what chilies in the salsa or in the dish. And it really makes eating them a little more enjoyable. But I always want to kind of um, tell people that chili heat is like salt. You can always put too much salt in a dish and ruin it, mm. and you can always make a dish too hot and ruin it. Now, I know that you're a bit of a wild chili hunter. There are even more chili species, species, species out there that, that, that haven't been cultivated, correct? Correct, correct. We've only uh, cultivated five, and we know of at least 34 more out there in nature. Could there be others we haven't discovered yet? Yes, there are. Uh, people that study the taxonomy of chili say they, they think that we've got three more kind of on the horizon that they'll be announcing that they've discovered. Hmm. And I've always heard that that the seeds and the veins is is where the the real heat is located. Now that is a myth. Uh, it is the veins. It's the cross wall of the chili that has the heat. The seeds have no heat, but being very close to those cross walls in the veins, you know, you, one would associate that with the heat. But the chi the walls of a chili are not hot, and we always have a little uh, joke here. We take someone to the our teaching garden where we have 150 different varieties of chilies, and I'll take a jalapeno and eat a piece of the wall, and then give some people somebody the piece of the vein. They'll their mouth will get on fire. And I'll look like, a, oh, I, it, I'm not bothering me a bit, but uh, it's just a little breeder's joke, we say. <laughs> the joke's not on you, though. <laughs> That's <not> right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the phones. Dale in uh, Evanston, Illinois. Welcome Illinois, to welcome Science to Friday. Hi, Dale. Dale, you there? Oh, we lost Dale. Oh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's go to Brooklyn. Hi, hey, Joe in Brooklyn. Welcome to Science Friday. Hello. My old hometown. Hi, welcome. Hello. So I had a question kind of going back to the, the last um, person. When I eat hot peppers, I, I get the hiccups. But when I drink a hot cup of coffee, I don't. So I'm just wondering how those two would be related, um, the receptors for the capsaicin and the, the hiccuping. Paul, do you have an answer for that? You know, that's it, it, that's a common phenomenon with a lot of individuals getting the hiccups. And it's just a different kind of reaction. Um, and sometimes I find that if people eat green jalapenos or green chili, they get the hiccups. But if they eat the red, they don't. So sometimes it's it's the type of chili. Well, uh, great answer. Let's go to uh, let's go back to the phones. It's to Zach in Osage, Iowa. Hi, Zach. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. I love uh, hot foods actually. So this whole thing is making my mouth water. And my question actually sort of goes back to developing a taste for uh, chilies. Um, when my mom was pregnant with me, she ate hot foods like it was her day job. And now I'm the person in my family who eats the hottest food pretty regularly. And I was just curious if there's any science that sort of backs like a hereditary desire for spicy food or if that's bogus or what, what the deal could be there. Your mom always loved him, huh? She still loves him? She doesn't like the, uh, hot foods as much anymore, no. Oh. Okay, Paul, what do you say? 
Is it? Oh, uh, as people age, we do change, um, and you know, we know from science that uh, our our taste buds kind of um, become less sensitive. And so uh, we don't taste as many flavors. And so usually as we get older, we do like hotter food because uh, we want that little more spice. Um, But everybody's genetically different. And in my career now, I've met three people that have no heat receptors in their mouth. And they can eat the hottest chili and it tastes like a bell pepper to them. Okay, now let's get to the part where I have to actually bite a couple of chili peppers here right in front of me. Uh, you have a taste test to help refine my uh, heat palate. You're going to take me through this test here. I have a, I have a Serrano and a, a Thai bird's eye chili well, here okay. in front of me. The first thing, d- don't take a big bite because uh, we, want, we want you to be able to speak at the end of this. So take a little, just take a little nibble. But what you're going to look for is first how fast the heat comes on. And with the Thai chili, it should be almost instantaneous. And then you're going to notice a very interesting thing about that heat is that the heat feels like pins sticking right. you. All right. And, and it. then it's going to be the tip of your tongue, and the heat should oh, not last God. very long. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Thai. Whoa. <laughs> I hit right at the tip that of my tongue. That may not have been a small bite. No, I just, I just, just the juice coming out. i got to pour some milk here. To, okay. Yeah. I can see if that works, the milk part. <laughs> mm. Actually, it does. It does. Very okay, good. so why was that? Science has been proven. <laughs> <laughs> why was that such a searing, you know, sharp pain? And, and as, as you say, it's really concentrated in one part of my tongue. Right. It's um, there's. We know that there are. At least, we've discovered at least 24 capsaicinoids, with capsaicin usually being the most prominent in in the capsicum anum. And uh, so each one of those capsaicinoids has a different effect in our mouth when we consume chilies. And so by knowing, you know, which which caps which capsaicinoids are in which chili, you can then tell which chili you're eating. And so, um, so one can assume, like with Asian chilies, you're going to have that sharp heat. And that was an interesting story. When I first came here, we tried to export red chili to, to Asia, and they told us we didn't have good quality. And we didn't understand what they meant because we could measure the color it was good. We could measure the heat level and mm-hmm. Scoville heat units and knew that. But they said you didn't have good quality. And then a few years later, we realized Asian chilies had this sharp heat. And so we looked at our chilies we were growing, found one that had the sharp heat, asked them to try it out. And they said, oh, yes, 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 that's very good. And so now we actually ship thousands of pounds of red chili powder to Korea to make kimchi or Japan to, to spice up uh, noodles. Wow. All right, now I'm almost afraid to take the, the next one, but, but for, just so I can speak while I can speak, let me remind you that okay, this is Science okay. Friday from PRI Public Radio International. All right, Talking with Paul Bosland here. Uh, I'm sorry, Paul. Uh, okay, I, I was just going to say on the Serrano, it's yeah. going to, to be a little slower, but it, the heat will be what we would consider rapid, but not as fast as the Asian. All right, I'm going to say that. And this heat's going to be flat. It's going to feel like someone painted the heat in your mouth instead of pins sticking you. Again, it'll well, be the front of the lo- mouth. Oh, yeah. Ah. <laughs> and it's it will, sneaking up. It's going to take a little longer to dissipate now. You're going to have to have that milk a little sooner than I'm tr- I'm uh, drinking, later. Believe me, I'm going for it. Uh, because mm. it, it, the heat there lingers. And one of the chilies that really has a lingering heat is habaneros. People will say, well, it's in the back of their throat, and it can actually linger for hours on some individuals. Mm-hmm. Well, well, is there a rule of thumb? Are, are red chilies hotter than green chilies, or it doesn't matter? <clears throat> you know, that's a very good question, and, and uh, neither the color nor the size of the chili can you tell how hot it's going to be. As we mentioned earlier, you almost have to cut them open and see how much veins are on those cross walls. The more yellow you see in there, the hotter it'll be. And then also, the the red chilies, if they come from the same plant as the green chili, will actually taste less hot to you, even though they have as much capsaicinoids, because the red fruits have sugars, and sugars is another way to counter the heat. So that sh- natural sugar that's in the red pods counters the heat, so they don't taste mm. quite as hot to us. You know, I'm a gardener, always looking for gardening tips. Is, is there a way to make your, your backyard chilies hotter? Yes, there is. Um, chilies get hotter if they're stressed. So if you will cut back on the water, make sure they're in, you know, maybe in the full sun where they're getting stressed in the afternoons, they'll always be hotter. But the, you know, the flip side of that coin is, is that you also have less yield when you stress a plant. So, so if you really want hot chilies, stress them and they'll be very, very hot. And mm. if you uh, don't 
give them really optimum care. You know, as a gardener, I'm trying to keep the squirrels out of my pots in the backyard from digging up the roots. So I, I planted some chilies right in the pot thinking, okay, squirrel came up to it, pulled off the chili, and as almost in spite, started chewing it right in front of my face <laughs> with absolutely no problem. <laughs> Like so, uh, that is that the best you got? <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid, uh, you know, all, all I can say it might be a Mexican squirrel, but no. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, we actually did a study here. We we planted lettuce out in in a in a field, and we put habanero powder on one set of lettuce plants, and nothing on the other. And the rabbits would come in the nighttime, and they would, and within about oh four or five days, had eaten all the lettuce with no chili powder. But once they have eaten that, they went over and started to eat the uh, the lettuce plants that had the chili powder. So it's kind of a choice, no choice. So uh, um, but that's all I can well, tell that, you on that that's, one. That's enough. That explains it, Paul. Thank you very much for joining right. us today. My pleasure. Paul Boslin, director of the Chili Pepper Institute and Regents Professor of Horticulture at New Mexico State University in Las Cruces.